Great. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started with our topic and the um, exploring both the science and sort of the practical realities of cold brew. And I'm Marcus Young with Cropster, and I'm super excited for today's session where we have Nancy Cordoba and Chris Miller. I'll have them just say a few brief words about their backgrounds um, as we get started. Nancy, do you want to start us off? Uh, hello. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, amazing webinar. Um, I would like to thank Crofster team for this opportunity to, to share uh, with, you, with you um, a small piece of our experience uh, navigating the complexity of chemical and sensory science in the fascinating coffee beverages world. Awesome. Um, well, I, can't, I can't wait to really dig into the details of that here in just a little bit, Nancy. Um, Thank you. And, and Chris from La Colombe, why don't you just share a little bit about, about your experience in coffee and with La Colombe, and then we'll jump more into the details here in a little bit. Hi, my name is Chris Miller uh, from La Colombe Coffee in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Thanks for everybody for joining and for having me today. Thanks, Marcus and the team at Crofster. Um, I've been with La Colombe for 16 years now. Uh, I've been in coffee for 16 years as well. Uh, so my, my entire coffee career has been spent at La Colombe. Um, we've seen a lot of, as being part of it, been able to see and do a lot of different things throughout the company and throughout coffee throughout this career. And uh, I think that everybody can agree the best thing about coffee is it's never ending. Keep going. Um, so yeah, that's, I am the director of roasting. So I oversee all quality uh, and quality control, purchasing, roast profiles, all that sort of stuff like that for the entire company. Uh, we are split up. Be with our main hub in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Then we have satellite roasteries in Chicago and Los Angeles as well. Um, and we have distribution point, our own distribution warehouse in Los Angeles. Um, but 99% of what we do comes out of Philadelphia. That includes all of the concentrate production for all of our cans that hopefully you all may have seen in your local grocery stores and other specialty coffee areas. Great, great. And, and Chris, you're joining us today from Philadelphia, right? I am in Philadelphia dealing with the cold, rainy remnants of Hurricane Ida. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm glad you could join us. And Nancy, you're in Bogota, Colombia, right? And that's also where you did your research? Yes, indeed. Uh, I am from Colombia, by the way. And I decided to start uh, my PhD studies in 2015, focusing my research on carbon coffee. Uh, as, as you know, coffee is an emblematic product in Colombia. Still, uh, even with solid research for the sector, there is limited research led innovation on uh, value adding processes such as roasting, uh, coffee brewing or extraction, uh, new coffee product research and, and developing. Um, but why Colbrio? Um, it's only, first of all, curiosity. Starting my, my journey, I realized the Calabria coffee market has begun to grow and the Calabria was offering with differing claims. However, uh, scientifically uh, speaking, uh, many of them were not completely uh, clear. So I, I decided to focus my knowledge, my time, uh, my life on understanding uh, some questions uh, about what is behind the carbrio, um, the carbrio coffee or cold coffee uh, brewing process. Uh, what is the different or there is different or not uh, with the hot brewing methods. So um, finally, my research started in 2016 uh, okay, with uh, a PhD. We'll get into the details of that in just a few minutes. So okay. and we have so many great slides to support that. Um, because yeah, as, as Nancy said, you know, this market for cold brew is really important. So part of our um, agenda today is to just, just spend a little bit of time talking about the market and how some market research has been done forecasting the continued growth of this category 
Um, I want to give Nancy a time to really dive deep into her research in brewing and extraction, but also roasting and even sourcing decisions and how that impacts the quality in, in the cup. And of course, I want to hear from Chris because I'm really excited to hear how, um, how practically as he manages this fairly significant production of cold brew, um, some of the practical aspects of both sourcing and roasting there. And, and hopefully Chris will have questions for Nancy as well, because I think what's always interesting for me is to sort of take this scientific approach, which um, as Nancy and I were talking, sometimes can feel, I think a little bit isolated maybe, but the hope is always that it, it extends to um, the commercial market. So as we get into what's next, We'll address some of that, and we will have some time for Q&A um, at the end of the session. And you know, why, why is Propster involved in, in exploring cold brew in this topic? Well, you know, as a software company that's really focused on addressing the needs of the coffee industry, you know, we have a lot of tools at our disposal or at the disposal of roasting companies and researchers in order to track and record and log lots of facets, almost every facet of green coffee purchasing and decisions from samples all the way through inventory. Um, when we think about roasting and the way that we're making different roasting decisions for any of our products, cold brew or espresso, filter coffee, we can track those profiles, we can record data, and we can cup and look at sensory reports that follow the life of a coffee through its green coffee life cycle, through various roast profiles, and all the way to the end. So. You know, Cropster is a tool, you know, Nancy, you used quite extensively in your research, um, and we appreciate that and are happy to have been part of it. Um, and personally, why am I so interested in cold brew? Um, I think it's a fascinating product. I think that I'm completely captivated by the fact that for many, many years early in my coffee career, cold brew is a sort of back of house cafe produ produced item that was like made in plastic buckets by baristas overnight. And we've really seen this major shift over the last decade or more um, from that kind of back of house cafe production to really like a manufacturing and production plant with you know, major investments by companies like La Colombe, you know, other companies that are entirely set up around cold brew production. And that's a major shift, um, which I think is fascinating. Um, of course, it's still being made in the back of house of a lot of cafes, and it's delicious, but it's, it's a really big shift for roasting companies. And I think understanding the science and the food science behind that is, is important. Um, the other thing that I get so jazzed about with cold brew is that now we have this product that is bringing specialty coffee like to the masses. It's like this great like democratizing product, because no longer do people have to go to a cafe or sort of seek out like more boutique coffee experiences. Um, now we have a product that you can find on the shelf at like a Target grocery store or at a, um, my, my experience with La Colombe that was such an aha moment is I was on a camping trip in this little town by a lake where it's just like they sell gas and like fishing rods. And there was a whole cold case like next to all the beer with La Colombe cold coffee. Um, so I think it's awesome that this um, is really bringing these, you know, our specialty coffee brands to a much bigger demographic. And so Chris, I'm really keen to hear a little bit about um, just La Cologne in general, like just kind of what your growth has looked like over the past few years, but also specifically um, a little bit about what the journey into cold brew looked like. Um, well, thanks for the plug. That's really nice slide there. <laughs> so we've, um, you know, I think that, you know, when we think about cold brew, I think that a big part of it is we look at the, the four companies that were kind of interlinked at the time, which is us, Blue Bottle, Stumptown, and Intelligentsia as being all kind of getting into the game at the same time on this. Um, I think that the real turning point for all of us is when Dwayne Sorensen started making the, the Stumptown stubbies. Um, I think that that was a massive shift where people were like, wait, you can do this. And the, I think that that was the perception changed at that point. And we were part of that too, where to go from the back of the house analogy is we were doing that already where we were making it more in our cafes was just the last barista of the day would just sit and pull shots for an hour or whatever, two hours and fill up a five gallon bucket. 
and just keep doing that. And that was the base for our cold brew. But once we started to experiment a little bit more and seeing people wanting, hitting a note, in particular at our 19th Street Cafe in Philadelphia, which is our original cafe, that really kind of perked up the owner's ears at that point. And we decided that this was something that we saw legs in. Um, and luckily, we've, we've been correct so far. Um, I think the category has changed so dramatically. We've all learned so much, but I still think the category is very much in its infancy. Uh, and Nancy's research into it like exposed me to a lot of different thinking on it. Um, as we've expanded, it, we originally came in and what, there you're looking at Todd Carmichael, who's one of the founders of the company. It was really a rush. Um, Todd saw the potential in it before any of us did. Um, at the time, I, I hadn't really drank cold brew, to be honest with you. Um, but Todd saw a lot of potential in it. And I think that Dwayne saw that. And I saw, also think that Blue Bottle saw that as well and James. And so as a result, like we were all kind of rushing for the same thing at the same time. Um, I think that it's been something that we've been able to continually improve upon. And I think that all of us have been able to approve upon it. And as we're seeing more technology and more research that's going into it, I think that kind of bears out the, the infancy of the process. Um, you're looking at Todd right there at our plant in Michigan, and that's a can filler. Um, the original plant was in the back of our warehouse here in Philadelphia at our Tioga Street warehouse. And literally Todd came in one day and said, we're starting this at the end of this week. I'm gonna need X amount of pounds of, at the time, our espresso coffee, and I need it roasted and ground like this. And we were like, oh, okay. Um, but that's kind of the nature of Loch Lom also is like, we're gonna rush into this and we're gonna figure it out as we go along. And I think that everybody had the original iterations of bottles and cans, not just from us, but from everyone. There was maybe some film on the top or there was some pasteurization that was going on and trying to figure out how that affected flavor. And we're all kind of tinkering at it as long as now. And now there's a bunch of different technologies for that. There's still everything that happens in cafes, but there's different filters for cafes. It's not just a toddy filter. There's all sorts of other filters that go along with it and scaling that. And you look at things like Beacon, uh, who have really kind of I think that's a tremendous leap in technology. And you're looking at Snapchilled and you're looking at all these different ways that people are making and producing cold brew. I think we're past the point of thinking, is this going to be something that's going to stick around? I think the technology is going to continue to evolve, but it's clear that from our growth that we've seen, and even in just the past year, as everything has been more grocery oriented and online oriented, like that growth of that category has outpaced the rest of our company. Um, we really see the growth exponentially growing in that year over year, if not month over month at this point. Um, we've experienced month to month over the summer and through this month so far, we've seen, we've blown our projections out of the water. We're having trouble making enough. Um, wow. And I think that people are going to have to like, as soon as the pandemic hit, I got text messages and phone calls from friends in the industry asking, how, how are we going to do this? And I was like, we've been doing this for seven years and we've only gotten to this point right now. Um, but I think that the technology will continue to evolve. Um, and I think that there's still a lot of really exciting possibilities that are coming along as a result of it. Right. And I mean, you were speaking specifically about La Colombe's growth, but this, um, this slide, which is just a snapshot from Grandview Research, they did a, a market study of cold brew and did some anticipated growth for the cold brew market. I think this is from 2018. Um, but you can see what trajectory they predicted where, you know, from 2018 to where we are in 2022, this segment has almost doubled and it, they're predicting it to double again in the next um, three years. So it's pretty significant looking at, um, at how this has grown. And I also really like this chart because it does talk about the various outlets, right? So a company like La Colombe and how you're selling um, cold coffee in your own outlets, but also supermarkets and convenience stores and online, it's it's become this major driver for the coffee market. So, and also those people that's are looking, amazing. people are looking for alternatives to sugary drinks. Uh, and like, you can see that at any grocery store you go to at this point is people looking or convenience store at that point, you're starting to see the shrinkage of the Cokes and the Dr. Peppers and, and the Pepsis. And you're starting to see more of things like us, or you're starting to see rise coffee, or you're starting to see bulletproof or whatever, take your pick there. Yeah. And it's super regional too on the west 
coast, you're going to see more verbs. You're going to see more things like that. And here in Philadelphia, everybody has their own can't. And it's a matter of like, you're looking at the rival brothers or you're looking at us like, or backyard beans in Philadelphia area. And they all have their own cans. And a lot of them are making their own cans and it's, there's a market there. It's clearly a market. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, when we look at some of the, the acquisitions in our industry by, you know, some of the very biggest companies in coffee, like Nestle and JAB, I mean, look at the companies they purchased Nestle with blue bottle, which had a successful market strategy with cold coffee, of course, Pete's and Stumptown and JAB, those stubbies that you mentioned, Chris, and that early forays into cold brew. I'm, I'm, well, I have no data to back it up. My, my instinct is that a lot of those boardroom discussions centered around these types of products. I guarantee it. Yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, just really, really interesting. And, and of course, you know, all of this growth, I think, um, as you said, it was, it was very much sort of like ad hoc back in the beginning. And a lot of these, you know, at least here on the West Coast, like in Portland with Stumptown and in Oakland with Blue Bottle, um, there were partnerships with dairies that helped figure out the stability and the science part of it um, because we didn't have a path forward. But then, you know, here comes on the scene, Nancy and her colleagues and her research, which I want her to, to start sharing a little bit. And we're going to go through, through some slides here that talk about her scientific approach and some of the background on the coffees and things she used. So Nancy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, it is a really amazing topic. Uh, I just started my PhD in started my PhD in 2016 um, with the idea of evaluating the effect of some some coffee extraction uh, um, brewing variables, uh, identifying physiochemical and sensory changes. Uh, is their relationship between them, but it is it is not easy to finish the, this year, but now I have a lot of questions. Uh, I think that it's uh, it is good. Um, but the cold brew coffee is growing in the market, but I consider that we need to increase the uh, scientific knowledge uh, about this type of product. In, in, in general, uh, our scientific approach was focusing in three main topics uh, related to a specific question that we wanted to answer. Uh, basically, in the, in, the in the sensory changes, uh, but at the same time, try to figure out what is the relation and what is the difference with the conventional hot coffee uh, brewing. Um, for our analysis, we use specialty coffee uh, from Linares, Nariño, Colombia. Uh, in the coffee roasting, we prepare different uh, curves using crop, uh, tasted different batch, a lot of batch. I use at the end two um, kilograms of green coffee beans in, in each one. Uh, we roasted coffee using a drum roaster with heating uh, propane gas, and we choose uh, two roasting profiles uh, more considering uh, previous scientific studies where it has been established that the flavor quality that develops uh, during coffee roasting it's not a state function described um, only by the physical parameters at the start at the end point of roasting instead it is a path depend function related to parameters uh, such as time and temperature. Uh, thus, uh, we use uh, two roasting profiles. Uh, we name high temperature, short time, HTST, and low temperature, long time, LTLT, until we reach a same uh, roaster level, in this case, a million roaster degree. It was uh, very uh, challenging. Uh, because it's not easy to to read to reach this uh, uh, same uh, roasted degree, but we use um, a param an, uh, specific uh, parameter. It is the color, uh, such as uh, lightness and other coordinates at the end of each uh, batch. 
Great. Yeah, and I know in a little bit we'll take a look at those roasting curves in a little bit more detail and the development phases and things. So, but it, I, I love this slide because I think it does point out it's. Um, I think often as roasters we think that we're like doing tests and trials and sort of applying a scientific method, but but we're really not. I think I'm always fooling myself when I think that I am because it does take this level of control that that you're able to bring to it and this sort of rigor. Um, that we just don't have time to in the commercial environments. So, um, at the end, I have to to highlight the uh, roasting. It's not only science; it's craft. It's uh, completely uh, sure uh, about that. So, um, in this uh, approach, we aim to evaluate the impact of roasting profile, time, temperature, and the brewing methods, uh, hot and 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 cold. Uh, we use uh, basically to cold brew methods, uh, the ripping and immersion. And for the um, uh, hot brew, we use an additional method, method or an example or conventional hot brewing, uh, which was the French uh, uh, press. Uh, we prioritize evaluating the effect the, the, the cold extraction conditions on total dissolved, uh, dissolved solids and yield uh titratable acidity or uh, chem chemical acidity and ph by instrumental methods uh, which is to analyze caffeine trigonoline and some chlorogenic acids in this case four and five uh, cafe alkenic acids because they, um, they, there are among the main noble volatile compounds uh, studied in coffee brutes um, brews, but at the same time, some of them had been related to some specific flavors, uh, such as astringency, bitterness, and mouthfeel. Uh, these uh, components uh, were quantified using uh, high performance liquid chromatography, HPLC. Um, given the little scientific evidence in cold brew, uh, we decide to analyze coffee beverages uh, entire volatile profile. So we measure the abundance of these compounds using, using head space, solid phase, uh, microextraction and, and gas chromography with mass spectrometry. This technique, uh, these techniques uh, allow us to identify the volatile compounds and the relationship with uh, uh, some relationship with uh, the flavor. So Great. additional, uh, additional, we 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 made a, a sensory analysis uh, because at the end of the day, I think the most important thing is the uh, the, the, the the sensory uh, perception. Um, in general, regarding the the physicochemical change, we found the roasting profile and the brewing method uh, impacted the TDS and the tritatable acidity. The highest values of these variables were achieved in, in beverage prepared with coffee roasted in the, in the profile the high temperature short time. Uh, it is important to point out that uh, there is a uh, during the roasting, there is formation of several chemical compounds, uh, for instance, organic acids. However, these compounds can be de 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 degraded uh, depending on the intensity of the, the condition of this process. This, uh, this could explain higher values of TDS and chemical acidity in coffee roasted at a high temperature short time found in, in our research. Um, regarding the brewing method, the highest TDS values were for the cold drip uh, method, while the tritable acidity was higher in the hot extraction beverage. Um, you know, delving into the mechanisms that drive the sensory profile resulting from the coffee beverage is complex uh, since it depends on many variables at the same time. Uh, we address uh, our research, consider that the cold and hot brewing differ mainly in the water uh, in, uh, using during the temperature uh, of water used dur during the preparation. Uh, to compensate the, this low temperature, it is necessary long time 
to achieve the structure of the molecules present in coffee. Uh, in the coffee extraction process, the, the temperature is the, is the driving uh, force uh, favoring the structure of the chemical compounds present in the coffee ground. At high temperatures, um, uh, you know, the, the kinetic energy of water molecules is higher. This amplifies the possibility of leaching out compounds from the coffee bed. Uh, uh, temperatures increase also uh, favor the solubility of many of these compounds. Thus, temperature plays a, a, a crucial role on, in the structure. For instance, some polar compounds um, usually related to acidity and sweetness in coffee are more soluble at room temperature. Uh, while other more related to bitterness require more temperature to be extracted. It is important to uh, highlight that high temperatures can also uh, cause uh, volatile compounds release affecting the coffee brew sensory uh, perception. Uh, aroma, it's a, uh, I consider that it's a key attribute in the coffee quality. Although it is established that the extraction affects the flavor of beverages, uh, volatile compounds uh, continue to be more studied in espresso and filtered coffee beverage. Uh, it's important that, uh, to note that each volatile compound has a specific uh, associated sensory characteristics. However, the um, perceived sensory impact depends of several factors. Uh, among them are their abundance in the coffee brew, their detection threshold and concentration, and also factors associated with the, the individual uh, perception. Okay, this, this figure is uh, a great because um, the relationship between the sensory perception and the chemical composition in coffee, it's not easy. Uh, to better understand the complexity uh, and intricate relationship between uh, both, um, we include in our um, studies a multifactorial approach. Uh, we use uh, this tool is uh, uh, named a principal component analysis. Uh, putting the relationship in a, in a graphical format, uh, we observe that the hot brew coffees are distributed on the right side. In contrast, the, the, the cold ones are, are located uh, on the left side, indicating a dominant effect given by the extraction temperature, uh, cold versus hot. In other words, um, according to the parameters evaluated, evaluated in our research, it's possible to, uh, to achieve uh, coffee beverage, uh, beverages differentiation. Uh, in this uh, specific example, this that analysis showed that the green coffee beans quality generated a market differentiation for coffees prepared uh, with hot water. Um, the difference showed in the figure were mainly due to uh, the prevalence of specific volatile compounds and sensory attributes uh, related to undesirables flavors notes pre predominant when we use in the extraction commercial or regular regular uh, coffees. Um, in general, hot brew, uh, when we use uh, a specialty coffee were more uh, related with positive attributes such as aroma, uh, body, um, nuria, cocoa, and roasted nuts. Uh, whereas cold brews prepared with a specialty coffee were mainly associated with sensory attributes such as butter, sweet aromatic um, notes, uh, malt, syrup, and, and caramel. Uh, with this, I wanted to show an integrative um, example about how can be related the chemical data with the flavor sensory profiles. Wow, I want to come back to in just a minute about this um, <laughs> conventional versus specialty in cold brew. 
But um, before I do that, I'm, I'm just really curious, you know, I, I put this question in the slide because, um, you know, can we predict sensory outcomes based on this analysis? And I think, you know, by extension, it's, um, you know, how can like a buyer and a roaster like Chris sort of take this research and use it to make some decisions? I mean, I think we can kind of keep this question in mind maybe as we get into the weeds with roasting and, and sourcing, but. Um, and then, oh. <laughs> and I think that that leads naturally okay. into this great statement that you shared with me yesterday. So I'll, I'll <laughs> give you some time. Which is this this idea, um, you know, is cold brew sweeter than hot brew? Which I think, you know, many people that's their sort of first impression when they taste it, or do we just think it's sweeter because it's less bitter? Um, which I love this because I think it speaks to the very complexity of what we're trying to study and understand, where we might be able to identify compounds in isolation, but it's really how they work together to create the sensory impact, which was that last slide. Um, Chris, do you have any questions for Nancy? I've kind of been asking some questions here, but it's we've gone through a lot of, of heavy content. Yeah, I think the thing that's interesting for me more than anything is just looking at the the, and I'm going to butcher the the names of them. Sorry, Nancy, but the high temperature, quick roasting versus the low temperature, low roasting. I think that that's really really interesting. And how did you like why was that something that you zoomed in on what what made you look at that more than something else oh yeah it's it's very interesting because at the beginning our research uh, roasting was uh, very hard to address uh, because uh, we know that uh, i think that 100% uh, of the changes in in coffee it happens in, in roasting. So um, we choose the uh, high temperatures or the parameters consider the scientific literature. But I think that uh, in the next um, in the next slides, there are more information about the, uh, the roasting parameters that we, we used. Uh, but I, I have to uh, I have to highlight that this was an an approach more focused in uh, figure out what uh, um, component change or not, or if it have an impact in, in color brew, because at the beginning we don't, we didn't have any information about the uh, roasting and the relationship with the, mainly with the color brew, because uh, I have to recognize that there are a bunch of information a, a scientific information about the, the roasting uh, using a, a different uh, flavor profile, um, color, but uh, we consider uh, mostly um, scientific uh, data more than uh, industrial data. And we want uh, to show that um, roasting is very important in color brew all, uh, also. Great. And, you know, and of course, so all of this starts with sourcing and, um, and I think um, I, I'm somewhat interested in this topic, be it from sourcing or be it like aged and old and sort of, you know, the, what we would think of as baggy tasting green coffee, you know, or even those roast profiles where things go wrong for, I think for too long, it's been sometimes a joke, sometimes maybe a reality that people would say, oh, if something's bad, just cold brew it just cold brew it, right? And um, I love that we're moving beyond that, that sort of thinking. And, um, and Chris, I'm really curious to hear from you um, a little bit about your approach to sourcing for cold brews. And thanks for sharing some of the, um, the flavor profiles for two of your core products. But maybe before we get into the Brazil, and the Columbia, you can talk a little bit about your strategy when you're looking at coffees and, and thinking about where they're gonna work. Yeah, for sure. So a lot of our coffees, the core, uh, I guess, classics for last, lack of a better term, or the cornerstones for our company are, are mainly Brazilian based. 
Um, I don't think that that's a surprise. If anybody's had our coffee, everybody's just gonna know like, yeah, the base for that is gonna be a, a natural Brazil or a pulp natural somewhere along those lines. Um, and then Colombia being a close second. I mean, this is bears out all over the industry as the two of the larger suppliers throughout the world, especially in terms of specialty coffee. Um, so what we were trying to do, the original cold brew that we did was actually the same coffee that we used for our espresso, um, which was a mix of Central and South American, then a washed African along with it. Um, but ultimately the base is going to be Brazilian. So what we were looking at is we we're thinking of our customer base more than anything else. And the thing that they gravitate towards apparently is a nice Brazilian coffee. So we're trying to replicate that in how could we do that when we're looking at a, a larger scale operation. Um, the more different single origins that we had in it, whether that was a washed Ethiopian or a washed Rwandan or something like that to complement a Brazilian and a Central American coffee, you know, it, it didn't really bear out for us that huge of a difference to be able to, we're not like necessarily muddying the flavors by adding all those different things. It's adding complexity, but we figured that we had good results from a Brazilian standpoint. So that's kind of where we were looking. And I think that it, a lot of it is just coming down to suppliers, you know, as far as looking from a supply standpoint, you know, we're very, very fortunate as we have long-term suppliers that we've partnered with at origin that can get us what we need consistently and over and over and over again. Um, and in particular, in this category, as we've seen the growth exponentially at this point over the past five, three, seven years, all that sort of stuff and making sure that we're gonna be able to consistently supply the same thing over and over and over again. The replica, rec, replicability, I guess that's a word, if I didn't just make it up, um, was ultimately one of the most important things. As we roast these coffees and we agtron them and we check the density and we're cupping arrival samples and pre-ships and all that sort of stuff that goes along with it, you know, we need to keep it going. Um, and if you go to Brazil and the whole point is going to set up the profile for the next year, two years, three years, and making sure that the supply is going to be able to meet you there at some place. And it's going to be consistent from year one to year three. Um, so I think that that was the main guiding principle is what I'm looking for is supply. Okay. But also, I mean, I love the variety here, right? I mean, this script Brazil, you know, even just the can, right? Bold and rich with notes of cocoa, but then borne out with the chocolate, toffee, cherry, caramel, baker's yeah. chocolate. I mean, it's really I, beautiful, right? And, and to counterpoint that with your Colombian, um, mm -hmm. like how, are, how do you think of these products in your lineup? Is there? You know, I think that if we look at our base, we're looking at our base as Brazil drinkers, you know, like that's such a big part of what we do. Our espresso, our main espresso, Nitsa, is a Brazilian based coffee. If we look at our main drip coffee, which is Corsica, that's a Brazilian based coffee. So, you know, that's what our customers really, really like. You know, as Colombians, or I'm sorry, as coffee and roasting and er all the information that we've all learned in the 10 past 10, 15 years, and as we've learned more about roasting and we've learned more about coffee in a million different ways. And we're all still really, really learning on all these things. Like think of all the different experimental processes we're seeing at origin at this point and micro lots and geishas and everything that goes along with that you know we wanted to present the a little bit more of a progressive vision um so we looked at the colombian you know like everybody knows colombian is synonymous with a quality coffee you know i love colombian coffee it's but you know the taste profile is going to be a bit different um when we look at the roasting process for both of these things we're looking at our Brazil is based on an espresso profile that we have and kind of modified, made a little bit lighter and kind of, but the, the bones of it are very, very similar. Where the Colombian is, we're looking at more things that are based on a single origin roasting profile for our Colombian that we have as a year round seasonal. You know, it's, it's gonna be, if you look at the names on it, you're not seeing anything that is gonna blow you away. You're not, not gonna see things that are gonna be wacky, not wacky, that's a wrong term but things that are gonna kind of throw you for a curveball. We're looking at a good solid Colombian. You're looking at caramel, you're looking at lemon, you're looking at a green apple sweetness, cocoa, vanilla, uh, cola, like all of those things are traditionally a nice representation of a Colombian coffee. You know, is it gonna be a, a micro process from Calca? Probably not, but is it gonna be a good solid Tolima? You bet. 
Yeah. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. And hopefully we can, if we look at the volume based on the strata between and sales between the two, like it's like a one to 12 ratio, like 12, like one Colombian drinker for every 12 Brazilian drinkers. So right. the palate, we're trying to not necessarily educate a palate, but you know, it's, it's, it's a stretch for people to look at a convenience store or look at a, a market or something like that to go from something that's really chocolatey and sweet and full of body to go to something that's acidity for. Yeah. And I mean, and I think something that, that has always stood out about your coffee program and I guess the company as a whole is that like, you know, you're like the perfect gateway company, right? That's kind of what I hear as you're talking about this. If somebody's only ever, their only real exposure to coffee is Dunkin' Donuts or Starbucks or what, you know, pick your big national or multinational brand, well, they can come to La Colombe and find something familiar. And that, I think that extends to your cafes. That's the case with these products, it sounds like. Um, and it, I love hearing you talk about it because it's like very core um, to what you're saying. Yeah, I think that's partially my philosophy on what we do as well. And like, God, wouldn't it be great if people came along and tasted the Colombian and be like, I really like that acidity forward coffee and like explore more of our single origins or go over to like a Machina coffee roaster or a reanimator coffee roaster or a Red Rooster coffee roaster or Olympia coffee roasting and be able to expose themselves to more possibilities of what coffee is. You know, everybody at this level, all of us have had that aha moment of the first natural Ethiopian that you have. And you're like, wait, it says it's blueberries and it tastes like blueberries. And if we can help move that that thing where we're not muddying things down with sugars you know where we're able to be like this is just coffee and water have at it and people can be like wait it can taste like green apples it can taste like lemon it can taste like cola and cherries i didn't understand and that progression will i think ultimately help coffee specialty coffee in particular as we move along in the future yep that's perfect um i love that and our host who's here um just sending me questions and things. He just, Nick, who's our cropster producer here, just said, you literally just explained his kind of first natural Ethiopian aha moment. Um, so it's so important for us that have been around a long time to remember that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and, and I noticed on both of those cans, Chris, you had um, roast levels and you even described like the more sort of espresso approach um, for the Brazil versus that, that yellow bland band at the top of the Colombian that talked about light roasting. Can you talk a little bit about your roasting approach for, yeah. for cold brew specifically? But it's, it's, still, it's always gonna be a work in process. Um, as Nancy's research has shown, like we still have a lot to figure out. Um, you know, we're constantly trying to get better at what we do and make a better product and get better yield and everything like that. And whether that's different roast profiles or extraction processes or density and looking at grind distribution and all the million things that can go to humidity in Philadelphia right now, which is bananas for August, you know, mm -hmm. like we're looking at all those different things. And when we look at the roast profile, there's tweaks that go along with it. Yes, we're doing our quality control. Yes, we're hitting our agtron points. Yes, we're analyzing every single roast. And we are also cupping oodles of coffee on top of that. The things that I think Nancy has brought up are things for us to think about in the future when we, when we have some time to like sit down and think about them. Um, not in August and September, but you know, maybe this February we can start thinking about like, hey, what if we did this a little bit more? I think something that interesting also that would, something that her research could also, the next thing to think about is roasting, roasting machines. And if we're looking at something like a thermalo roaster, like a fully air roaster that we're seeing at a massive industrial scale versus mm -hmm. like a probat, or if we're looking at a shop, like kind of fluid bed roaster or versus a geezen, like how is that contact and how is the roasting process going to affect it? You know, you can see a Neuhaus Neotech roaster that can roast coffee to desired temperature in five minutes, you know, like that's incredible. I wonder mm -hmm. how that would bear out when we look at it in version of like from scale. And if we look at that in terms of somebody like a, a, a bigger corporation than us is looking at how are they gonna, what's the 
like what are the ramifications of that and how that's going to affect the choice of people's roasting equipment and what they buy as well. Right. No, that's super, super interesting. Um, and, you know, and, and Nancy, I'm, I'm going to give you a, the floor to talk about your specific research with roasting, but we have a question that came in um, from one of our attendees, Kevin, um, that I think is appropriate for both of you. So I just want to pose it here and maybe Chris can make some comments and then Nancy can pick it up. Um, have you found a difference in the desirability of flavor profiles um, between lower versus higher agtron readings? So yeah, darker for sure. and lighter roasts. Yeah, for sure. Um, what, like I had said before, is like if we look at the Brazilian versus the Colombian, like the Brazilian is approaching second crack um, as far as a roast darkness. And if we're looking at the Colombian, it's two minutes into first crack you know, like, or two minutes past first crack, you know, so it's, it's not crazy dark. We're looking at agtron scores in the sixties for a Colombian and in the fifties for a Brazilian, at least on our scale for agtrons are going to be all over the place, but on the gourmet scale, that's what we're looking at. And like the taste is clear is like the, the tastes are going to be drastically different when we look at those things. And they're also bearing out in the market as well as that we sell it's 12 to one on, as far as Brazil sales to Colombian sales. Um, and we've seen that across all the different things that we have, whether that's in cans, whether that's in the multi-serve bottles that we have at grocery stores, or whether that's in the bag in the box that go in the fridges, you know, that's borne out as far as all of our product line is that this is the taste profile that our customers are looking for. So yeah, I can say definitively for our customer base, at least the darker roast, they're going to want to have like, as that gateway that I look at as our company they're going to want to have that kind of roast characteristic. They're going to want to have like brownie ends, you know, like things like that, that go along with the, the Brazilian. And hopefully we can move them more into the Colombian aspect that God, I would love to have a washed Ethiopian in there. A really nice salad washed Yerga Chefe in there would be amazing. And to be able to expose our customers to that, but that is going to be such a massively different roast profile. That is going to be such massively different flavors. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's one of the, those things that we would have to dip our toe into to see what our customer base thought. Right. And, and Chris, does that general preference for the slightly darker profile, does that extend outside of your cold brew products as well? Would you also make that claim yeah. about like bagged coffee and coffee yeah. of the day in the cafes? For our customer base, what we're looking at is if we look at for, I'm going to use general terms, second wave coffee, our darker roast coffee, things that are well into second cracker or beyond, you know, that makes up 90% of what we do versus our single origin department, which is about 10% of what we do. Yeah. Um, this mirrors a lot of friends in the industry. Um, this shouldn't it, it be a exactly surprise. What I hear. Yeah. Every time and I blends, hear. like yep. blends versus single origins. I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, anybody who has their own roasting business. It might skew a little bit one way or the other, depending on your company. But ultimately, I hear it from friends locally. I hear it from friends internationally. It's kind of mirrored the whole way through. Yeah, me, me too. And it doesn't matter, like whatever, like the 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 trappings are of of third wave hipster, like bleeding edge coffee companies. When I really get into the brass tacks with with the roasters and the owners, yeah, it's almost always the blend or the more whatever they're accessible coffee is is almost always the best seller so so nancy um as you talk about your the some of the specifics of your roast profiles and your research um i'm also just curious um if you have addressed yet or if you will be addressing roast color since your research was to a standard color profile yeah, it is a, a, a little a, a tricky topic in, in my in my research. Um, by the way, for our for our research, uh, it was vital to use Crofter because uh, it allowed us to establish roasting curves and get additional information to reach uh, reproducible uh, batches. Um, we made. I have to be honest, we made uh, many experimental uh, batches. Um, how said uh, Chris, uh, we taste a lot of, um, a lot of uh, modification in, 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 in the process, but I consider uh, that it was uh, very hard, hard in 
at, uh, in um, high temperature short time conditions since the time established by literature, scientific literature, doesn't exceed six minutes for us to reach a medium roasted in a short time was not easy busy. But at the end, adjusting the different percentages uh, of air bulb opening and the input of, of the, the gas, uh, we made it. Um, but it was hard because the idea uh, in this point is to it, it was figured out what happened uh, with the with coffees at the same roasted uh, color or roasted level. So um, in addition to, to temperature and time, other parameters uh, such as the, the um, drying uh, major and developed time was also great clues to, for obtaining similar, uh, similar curves. Um, we use um, we use the, the coffee roasted at a different time temperature um, to prepare cold brew by by dripping uh, an immersion and hot brew. Um, in some uh, interesting results, um, coffee roasted at high temperature short time profile, you see in cold and hot in hot and cold brewing. Uh, allowed coffee beverage with higher concentration of chlorogenic acid with a slightly higher sensory um, perceived acidity than those uh, brew with uh, roasting profile for long, lower temperature or a long time. Um, these changes can be related to a lower degradation of chemical compounds during the, the process. Uh, thus, in high temperature, short time, uh, also there, there is a, a higher porosity and um, volume uh, could uh, generate a greater extractability of some compounds. Uh, but at the end, uh, I think that the uh, flavor profile was um, more, uh, was uh, better in roasting conditions the long time. And, uh, and um, low temperature, long time. Um, cold, re cold dripping brews uh, showed higher caffeine and ca caffeolkinic acids compared to cold immersion and hot brews. Um, roasting at lower temperature and long time uh, promote fewer total pyrazine. These components are related to earthy and roasted uh, flavors. Um, in general, the, the sensory uh, analysis results showed a significant impact of the roasting profile on the intensity of the specific uh, flavor notes such as roasted and, and mainly detected in, in, in low temperature long time. Uh, on the other hand, the brewing method is significant, is significantly affected the intensity of sweetness, nutty, and uh, floral sensory attributes. Their intensity was higher in cold brew coffees than in hot coffees. Uh, therefore, the relationship between roasting profile and brewing method affect the intensity of aroma, caramel, malt, uh, and other, and other uh, sensory uh, attributes. Um, the, uh, in this uh, figure, the multivariated uh, analysis uh, on the left side, we find color structure by cold repeat and immersion, and the other side, the hot extraction. It is a clear differentiation. Uh, it doesn't matter uh, what uh, uh, roasting profile we use, uh, cold brew and hot brew are separate. Uh, regarding the chemical compounds that we evaluated at the same time, the sensory profile in general, in coal extraction, coal we prepared by dripping, we roasted a uh, profile uh, for low, uh, low temperature, long time, was correlated with bitter and roasted notes. In contrast, uh, those brewed by immersion were more related to sweet related attributes. To conclusion, depending at, at the same time, it, it is very important the roasting profile, but 
uh, the brewing method in the cold brew also it's important and I consider that uh, this um, these techniques need some uh, more research about how it works and what is the effect not only in the extraction of the compo compounds but at the same time in the in the in the coffee uh, flavor. Amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, just thinking of and talking about what's next. Um, Chris, what's on the horizon for you all? Um, and Nancy, I'm going to give you a chance as well. We already know the brewing and the, and the extraction is a big question for you. But, but Chris, what are things that you're curious about and exploring and moving forward with? Uh, I'm really excited to explore the risk profiles that Nancy has brought to light and her friends and team. Um, I, colleagues, I think that that's really, really interesting and something that we will definitely be exploring in the future. Um, as far as the future of the industry, I, I think the sky's the limit. Again, I think that we're still in the infancy. And I think that if you look at something like that for us, we call it a cold brew shandy. And we have another one that is actually a lemonade. And um, it personally, it, it sounds kind of gross. Um, but then when you have it, like it's super polarizing, um, at least internally. Um, but some people are either going to love it or they're going to hate it. And, but there's the possibilities I think are pretty open. If we're looking at different technologies with whether that's a snap chill or something along those lines, I think that the industry still has a long way to go. I think that exploring those possibilities, whether that's cascara or whether that's some sort of thing that we're trying to amplify the flavors of coffee or complement them. So it isn't just coffee in a can. Like, how are you going to complement that? How is it going to expand? Because I don't think that the trend is going to stop. I think that it's here to stay. And it's, I think the creative people are going to be the ones who are going to be able to push it forward. And what's that going to mm -hmm. be like? How are you going to, how are you going to make it taste better? How are you going to want people to come back? It can't just be coffee and milk or just nitro. Like, I think that some creativity is going to come through this where it's going to be like, okay, so we could do, it's not just going to be like CBD, you know, like, I think that there'll be other aspects that people are going to look at as far as like, well, let's think outside the box. Yes, I love coffee. Mm -hmm. What else you got? Um, and I think that's what mm -hmm. we're trying to do consistently, whether that's looking at different, like doing an oat version of what we do, doing these cold brew cans, you know, everybody's mm -hmm. going to laugh at pumpkin, but you know, pumpkin, like, I don't know where you guys live, but everywhere that I'm seeing, everything's already got pumpkin flavored Cheerios out and pumpkin ears, you know, like that's a real thing. And like, we've decided we're going to use real pumpkin in ours rather than just the flavoring. And like, how is the, we're going to expand the category and like get creative with it. I think that that's the exciting stuff that will come that I don't think we're there yet, but I think that mm -hmm. people are trying to think outside the box. Yeah, no, I love that, Chris. We, um, on a recent road trip, we drove through the small town of Ashland, Oregon. And um, there's a great coffee roaster there, Noble Coffee. And we stopped in for coffee in the morning, but you know what? They had canned coffee tonic and it yeah. wasn't cold brew. It wasn't espresso. It was a cascara tonic. And they had it sweetened with agave. They had lemon, they had ginger. And they were like beautiful cans, beautiful presentations. And I love that along with this kind of shandy, like thinking out of the box, recognizing that our competition for these products are sodas and energy drinks and all of this like uh, to me it's like such an exciting world um i think that we're really also going to be expanding against other categories who are trying to get in there too um and i think that there's some really great examples of if anybody's had the rishi botanicals can i think is what they're called wow those are good and wow those are really interesting and people are going to try and figure out how to get more tea into these things people are going to try and figure out how to get cascara in there there there's yeah. there's other possibilities for this and now the box is open for people to start thinking about what other things do people drink like the pop yeah. and bottle stuff like the almond lattes that they have god those are good but like yeah. no it's great and thanks for being part of things. the part of the tribe that's leading us there chris i think it's exciting um and, you know, we, we do have just a minute for Q&A, but I also, Nancy, I just wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit about what's next for you. Um, and also, if you can share, um, and we can post this on the show kind of notes as well afterwards, um, but where can people find your research if they actually want to read the published papers?
I'm not, maybe the internet in Colombia is um, a little compromised now. She seems not just silent, but frozen on my side. So I wanna give her just a minute. Well, if we made it the entire hour and it's only at the very end where we lost Nancy, she's dropped off now. Um, I consider that a success. Um, we do, it's, we're a little bit over time, but if anybody has any last questions, please type them in um, the chat and we will get those and share them. Um, but following up with this, this will be posted on our YouTube channel in the notes there, we can provide some links to some of Nancy's research. I know um, that was a question um, from one of our attendees. Where can we find that? Um, oh, and a great question from Tony Chen as well for, for I think, um, Chris, you know, what are the greatest hurdles for cold brew products in the future? And how are brands going to differentiate in this competitive category? Yeah, I think that that goes back to innovation. Um, how are people going to innovate and think outside the box? Uh, I don't think it's going to be enough to just have a, a solid cold brew coffee um, in a can or in a bottle or in a Tetra pack or something like that. I think that people are going to have to start thinking outside the box of like, okay, how are you going to augment this? Let's yeah. look further down the road. Perfect. Um, and we kind of had a broad ranging discussion, but another question from an attendee is um, like for nitro cold brew, like just, Real specific, do you have a different sourcing, roasting, brewing strategy versus regular cold brew for your nope. nitro versus your other products? No. It's all the same stuff. Okay, great. Um, and Nancy, it, now that you're back, welcome back. Um, any uh, last comments um, from I'm so sorry, or... I lost my connection. <laughs> oh, no worries, no worries. I said, if we're just at the end here, so if that was the worst it got, that's not bad. But with like our last minute, Anything that you want to share about what you're going to be researching next or any takeaways for our attendees? Okay, yeah, I completely agree with Chris. Um, I know that there are so many options in the market, but uh, I have to be honest, I can't imagine what is the, the flavor uh, coffee with a, a lemonade, but it is great because at the end of the day, um, our new, new sensory experience that the people are looking for. So uh, at the scientific level, it is important to highlight that um, uh, roast and studies con continue growth, um, uh, showing that there are still several gaps in the area of research. Uh, at the same time, all the studies in, in coffee brewing have increased, a new beverage uh, on the market, such as uh, uh, Le Colom uh, products, um, require more research in order to understand uh, what happened uh, with the flavor, but at the same time with the shell life. Uh, other part of our research uh, was focused on the uh, cold brew shell life in the relationship the microbiological point of view, but at the same time, the flavor point of view shed life, but relate, related with uh, uh, um, shed life, um, non volatile and volatile compounds. Uh, I think that is a very interesting topic. And the, and the other one is uh, about the, the, what happened with the sweetness of the coffee. It's uh, more sweetness or less bitter. It's a, it's a great issue for, for my uh, research career. <laughs> great. Now, I'm so excited to see where this goes. And um, I want to thank everybody who attended. I especially want to thank Nancy and Chris for sharing so much of your research, your work, your company. Um, and I hope we can continue to have more conversations as time goes on. But thanks everybody so much. Um, and hopefully we will see you for our next webinar. And you can always find us and more about Cropster at cropster.com too. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.